how do you guys choose music, and what's, what role do you, what dramatic role do you see the songs playing in the way you tell the story? Well, by and large, we put the music on last. We shoot the episode, make it as dramatically and comedically good as possible, uh -huh. and then look at it, and, tr and usually we try various songs um, placed against the picture. I've gotten from David 20 requests for one scene, and the difference between one song to the next is black and white. You can do something that obviously complements the scene and is in very much in sync with what you're, what you're describing emotionally. Sometimes it goes completely against it. David is like a jukebox. He'll pull some obscure, you know, song from the, you know, doo-wop song from 1956 or something, and he'll remember, like, the, the lyric in the fourth verse of the doo-wop song before the chorus, or how often the chorus was repeated, or if there was an instrumental bridge. So do you have someone who brings you sort of ten songs for this scene, and you, and you pick one? No. There are songs that I've either thought about or I've always wanted to use or I'm always listening for. I mean, Scorsese first did it in Mean Streets, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and Kubrick has done it also. They don't use score. They use, I guess it's recorded music. I mean, I remember Mean Streets just blew my mind because of the, the way that was used. And that, was a, that was a signal event in my life. And so when this show came about, I just, all I knew was I didn't want to have a score. He didn't want to hire a composer because he didn't want to tell the audience how to feel. We've established kind of a working environment in which uh, try anything. And th some of those moments I think we've had very great success with. When you say what will work, why does the song work with that picture? You just really don't know. There's some kind of a, the two things come together and there's this electric charge. The A3 song, I mean, had you heard that song I heard before? that on the radio. Uh-huh. And it just, it just struck you that this could work. I heard that on the radio about maybe six months before we were going to do that. It's just, it's just, I remembered the song. I liked it. It's got this great beat, and it's got that Howlin' Wolf sample and all that stuff in it. And then we put it up against the picture, and it was just like, oh, my God. Like, your mama told you you'd be the chosen one. Your father never taught you about right and wrong. You Well, right. this is perfect. It's a very powerful stuff. With Jimmy with the cigar and then driving the car through Jersey and I had the hairy arms and, I, and when that song was going on, some women said it was very macho, very uh, physical, very sexual kind of a thing. I guess she fell in love with him, you know. When I first heard it, I thought, this is too close. You know, it's too obvious. I got myself a gun. Uh, that occurs all the time with David. You think, I'm not sure I would have done that. And then, you know, a month later you think, well, that's just fantastic. You know, I wish I'd thought of that. At first, I wanted to do a different song every every week, uh -huh. and HBO wisely said, I think, said, no, no, no. People want it when they're in the next room and they hear that song and they know the show's on. They like can the Brady Bunch, right? Like the Brady Bunch, exactly, <laughs> exactly the Brady. Are the songs you play are they supposed to sort of be in the world of the characters, or it's sort of a separate reality coming into? Both. I mean, because we use songs that would never, you would never have nothing to do with their world. I remember when we first got started, after we did the pilot, I was talking to Stevie Van Zandt, and I was sort of breaking his balls a little bit. I said, well, you know, I want to use music, a lot of the music that would be that sort of that Tony and Carmelo would have listened to in high school. I said, like, I want to use this, like, Loverboy, remember that band? He went, oh, my God, oh, no. Well, <laughs> that's a discussion we have a lot. And it's a, it, it's a tough one, because... You know, you want to be authentic and you want to be, you know, but of course, to really be authentic, you know, they're going to listen to a bunch of terrible shit, <laughs> you know? I mean, it's going to all be like 70s and 80s rock, you know what I mean? That's, that's what they listen to. With Tony, I think it's important not to be afraid of the pop culture that's fed to him in his world and what is just easily digested and played, you know? and played out. I'm always like, well, can we at least find something kind of cool <laughs> from that era, which you know, takes a bit of work to find something. But if you find something that's like too cool, then it's no longer, it no longer works in the scene. You know what I mean? Now it's no longer, it doesn't fit, you know? So it's tricky business. Oh, there he is. Also, you have, you know, well, Stevie Van Zandt. Stevie Van Zandt. There's a song he does called Inside of Me, which is one of my favorite songs, which we have used. Uh -huh. That song, which I heard in, like, 1981, after he'd left Springsteen, he was with, he had formed this band, mm -hmm. The Disciples of Soul, Little Steven yeah. and The Disciples of Soul. And I said, someday I'm going to write a TV pilot, a TV show, mm -hmm. 
the theme song of which is going to be that song. Mm -hmm. But the thing that's interesting to me about it is I said that before, long before I knew Stephen Van Zandt, mm -hmm. and yet there he is in the show. How did that come about with him being on the show? I used to listen to those albums with headphones on, and also and I'd look at this Italian guy, and I used to think, look at that face, at that you know sort of intense thing. Then I was we're casting the show, and I saw him on, well, inducting the Rascals into the yeah the Rock and Roll, Rock Hall, of Hall of Fame, and he did the induction, and he had a great presence about him. Uh huh. And I said, that's that guy's got to be in the show. I was very surprised. It just it, he wasn't just it wasn't just lip service, like you know, I'm a fan of yours, but really I'm a fan of Bruce's, which is. You know, understandably, what I get 100% of the time. <laughs> you know, it's not even 99% of the time. It's 100% of the time, you know. Where the fuck you been? You're late. Highway was jammed with broken heroes on a last chance power drive. He's really been an inspiration. I can't imagine the show without him. Ah, uh -huh. wow. Well, he's quite, a, he's got an encyclopedic knowledge oh, of music, too. He's amazing. Yeah. He's amazing. From his underground garage, we've used a couple of songs that he's reminded me of or we've talked about. This is really a pretty, this is a very pretty song. It's. Nils Lofgren's song called Black Books. This is an example of music that was sort of, that was not in my framework. I didn't know this music. And then we met him through Stevie and he gave us this great CD and on there was this song. And um, it just worked really perfectly for this. But this, this was not something that I knew since I was a kid or anything like that. Uh -huh. um, it just came to us as like a gift and it was great. It's about somebody who wants to leave her relationship. Mm -hmm. She wants new shoulders to cry on, new backseat to lie on, and she always gets her way. And then it brings us into the next scene in which she goes home to Tony and she's very, very depressed and she um, sort of holds him up for $50,000 for Columbia University. Mm -hmm. 50 G's. Yes. What happens here is that this is the best she can do. This is the episode in which a shrink, a very old shrink, had told her to leave him. It said that it was blood money uh -huh. and that uh, take your children, go as far away as you can. You look like you could use a night off from cooking. We say we go out. And he said, and one thing you can never say is you haven't been told. Mm -hmm. That's the end of this episode. And so she hasn't got it in her to leave. Mm -hmm. But she takes that blood money and gives 50000 of it to Columbia University, which allows her, I guess, to live with herself. Have you ever commissioned or had songs written specifically for the show? There's a Bob Dylan recorded a Dean Martin song called uh -huh. Return to Me. And how did that come about? That came about... I'm not exactly what the real genesis of it was, but Bob Dylan's manager, Jeff, said that Bob Dylan would like to do that song for our show. Return to me. It was Mr. Dylan's idea. Did he word anything? He probably went down to Florida. <laughs> Bro, I'm sure he's fine. Nothing but lies coming out of this guy's mouth. Right, come on. He seems totally engrossed and depressed by what's happened to poor Jack. And he's coming home. He's returning to Rosalie, our lyrics. We haven't done as many instrumentals. Mm -hmm. And lyrics are just another form of dialogue, if you want to put it that way. It's a Greek chorus, you know? Right. David's a writer, so he, he brings a sensibility of the written word with music. It's not his style to use something where the writing in the song takes that much of an on-the-nose aspect. I mean, there are, there are several people who, if we just used no, nothing but their music, the Stones, Dylan, and Elvis Costello, we could have done the whole show with, with <laughs> really? e any one of those people. Literally, we could have done the entire series, could have been uh, the Rolling Stones sing about the Mafia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> or Bob Dylan sings about the Mafia. Uh -huh. it, could have, it would have just been... It would have been so easy, and I don't know, I don't know how to explain that. And what is it about Elvis Costello that... You, that mm -hmm. There's a certain drama. It seems that some of those songs have the same preoccupations that our show does. Intimacy. Well, uh, intimacy yeah. and, there's something very brooding and masculine about it. And menacing. I think there's a lot of menace. And menace, yeah. There's a commonality in these artists in that they shoot from the hip. In other words, they're not talking about light fare. 
they say things which are like, I love you, I hate you, I'm lonely, I'm despairing, you know, very direct, and they don't pull any punches. And uh, to me, that that is what the show is. We were talking before the camera started rolling, which I was interesting, is you talked about how in the show, when you're writing the show, that a lot of times every word coming out of everybody's mouth is a lie. <laughs> Especially the Tony and the crew, uh -huh. and the other guys from New, the guys from New York. Most of what they say is not accurate to either to what they're feeling mm -hmm. or the real state of the world. Do you think they're aware that they're lying in this moment? Sometimes and sometimes not. Uh huh. It's just second nature. Because it's just duplicity comes with the criminal life or duplicity comes with just being a male? No, it's just, I think it's the criminal life. Uh -huh. I, think, I think they're just so used to uh, not telling the truth. Uh -huh. Very little of what they say is the truth. Yeah, I was thinking about this because you talk about the sentimentality of a lot of the, of the songs that that Junior is singing, and you know, that seems to be sort of a lie embedded in a lot of that. And you know, so using the song to try to create the emotion that everyone thinks they should be feeling. Yes, right, right. That, I would say that's accurate. And how did it come about that you used uh, Dominic Gianese singing himself? You know, it just seemed right for the story. Yeah. That he would be at this uh, at this wake. You know, have to be persuaded to sing, which of course he wasn't. He couldn't wait. <laughs> You know, and I'd heard Dominic sing these songs, uh -huh. um, and it just, it just felt right for the story, mm -hmm. that he would lapse into this sentimentality, and that all these people, you know, that this Jackie Jr. was dead, and all these people would be, like, crying these crocodile tears listening to this, you know, this very sentimental Italian Neapolitan music. Mm -hmm. What's that mean, Warden Graza? Ungrateful heart. It's a universal feeling of a man who uh, tries very hard to please his family, to be the family man that he wants to be. It's not only Italian or Italian-American, or uh, it, it transcends all kinds of cultures. Do non pins a dolore mio. David did ask me, what does that line mean in that song? And I said, it means that you don't think about my pain. And of course, in that scene, the children have an attitude of, why is that, that old man singing these songs? And, and you know, why are people crying? They're such hypocrites. The kids just don't understand that uh, they're crying because uh, if the heart is ungrateful, it makes you cry. And how about the end, then the music over the end credits? How do, how do you think about that? I mean, because mo most people... That takes that. a lot of time. Uh -huh. We try, try this and then do you, that. Do we usually use a snippet of the song early in the show? Sometimes. That, that will then... Sometimes, play. ideally. That's, that's nice when you can do that. What you gonna do tonight When you need some loving on your time Okay, now we have uh, Otis Redding. Yeah. This, I think, is one of the first times where the song went through more than one scene, and the whole, I think the whole last four or five minutes of the show is scored with this. Mm -hmm. and, and I was really happy with the way it turned out. And Stevie actually said to me, said that that was great. He, he liked this, this usage. It's a different lover's prayer than Otis <laughs> was talking about, but <laughs> the song is just so great, it kind of transcends the fact that the lyrics could be taken literally, you know? This scene with this song. I mean, I could still get choked up about this. How come? It's very sad. It's very sweet. No! Oh, my God! Crazy! See, it goes from this death sequence to this sex sequence. I think we're rooting for this couple on some level. Mm -hmm. To solve their problems, to get beyond their small-mindedness. I think we want them to be happy. And we want them to find each other and find themselves. Mm -hmm. And it ends with Tony and Carmelo's hands, like, really clenched tight. And then you go from that to this, these are angels here. So it's, you know, prayers and angels, and it comes on before the titles, and we right. move into the titles with it. And you, well, it just takes you out of the show and back right. into, your, into your own life, right? Well, I think that's a good point, is because I think the music, it helps create the natural mood. I mean, because the music you choose, you know, is so seductive and energetic and menacing and often very emotionally, very, uh, very accessible. To me, it just, it really, it rounds out the show in this way that is often so surprising. And feels, you know, oddly organic to the scenes. And, I mean, that, that must be much harder than it looks. Yeah, we have to try out a lot of different stuff. Uh-huh. And some things are almost there and then not quite right or it just doesn't fit with the picture. You have to, you have to try. And, and you, but you do know it when, it when you see it. <laughs>